Ezra chapter 7 is where we pick things up tonight, Sunday nights, heading through the Bible from Genesis to Revelation and finished at the end of chapter 6 of Ezra last Sunday night. The book of Ezra has a theme, and the theme is the return of the remnant Israel, southern kingdom of Judah, had been taken captive by the Babylonians, and God restores them back to their land. He allows them to return to their land. And so it has a theme of returning. It has a theme of restoration. And that's a great theme for our lives. And that's a theme that at one time or another, you know, we're all appreciative of, whether it's, you know, some overt falling away or going into captivity or just the Lord coming along and shining His light in our heart and realizing that maybe we've drifted a little bit in our heart. And you, oh, Lord, so glad that You're involved in restoration. So glad You're involved in giving second chances. And so, beautiful theme of this book. The first six chapters of Ezra are given to the first of two returns by God's people to Judah, to Jerusalem. There were two returns from the captivity. The first one was under a man by the name of Zerubbabel. And uh, the book isn't called Zerubbabel, though he has uh, as great a part in uh, you know, this book as Ezra does. It's named after Ezra because Ezra wrote it. And so that's the way it goes. And so they named it after the author. And so the first six chapters given to the return from the captivity under Zerubbabel, and then chapters 7 through 10 have to do with the return from the captivity under Ezra. And so we pick it up in verse 1. Now, after these things, in the reign of Artaxerxes, king of Persia, Ezra, the son of Saraiah, the son of Azariah, the son of Hilkiah, the son of Shalom, the son of Zadok, the son of Ahitub, the son of Amariah, the son of Azariah, the son of Marioth, the son of Zerahiah, the son of Uzi, the son of Buki. And don't uh, quote me on that. Don't, uh, you know. <laughs> could be Buki, could be Bucky, could be I don't know what. But the son of Abishua, the son of Phineas, the son of Eleazar, the son of Aaron, the chief priest. This Ezra came up from Babylon. And so, He lays out the genealogy of Ezra all the way back to Aaron the priest. Why? To tell us that Ezra, that's what his office was, was that he was a priest. He was of the lineage of Aaron and and thus able to be a priest and perform the priestly duties of of, uh, the nation of Israel. And so that's his ancestry. And he came up from Babylon. And notice the description of him uh, here is that he was a skilled scribe in the law of Moses, which the Lord God of Israel had given. He was a man whose life had been given to the study and in the, the interpretation of the Scriptures. That's what his whole life was about as, as a scribe. And not only was he a scribe, but he was a skilled scribe. As we study Ezra tonight, one of the things that we're going to notice about him is that all of the characteristics of his life are going to come back to this. That he was a student of the Word. That he knew the Word. This was the supreme characteristic of his life. One of the things that's interesting is it relates to the men and the women that God uses. And we see it so often in the book of Acts is that they were men that knew the Word of God, and they had a working knowledge of the Word of God. They didn't just know it, but they were skilled in it. They were able to handle the Word themselves, uh, address questions questions themselves, find the answers themselves out of the Word of God. And and we're all growing in that and that kind of thing. But they, they had that working knowledge of the Scriptures. And as Ezra is described here as a skilled scribe, of the law of Moses, there is then that description of the law of Moses at the end of verse 6, which, had, which the Lord God of Israel had given. In Ezra's mind, it was a non-negotiable. He speaks of the fact that the Scriptures, the law of Moses, 
that these things were God-inspired, that the Word of God was God-breathed. And I think that all a person needs to do to come to that conclusion is just read the Bible with an open mind and, and have a sense for what's happening within it, which is difficult because a carnal mind can't. But, I mean, once you've read this under the direction of the Holy Spirit, there's no way that you can say a man could ever have written this. And, and so Ezra, this was his characteristic of his life as he knew the word and he knew it well. And the king granted him all his requests according to the hand of the Lord his God upon him. Now, notice that phrase, according to the hand of the Lord his God upon him, because that is the biographical statement for Ezra. It's going to be repeated many, many times as we head through the passage that we're getting through, going to go through tonight. I know we're going a little slow here to begin with, but we're going to get there. But this is a phrase that's used over and over again. He, when something happens in his life, when he's given favor in some way, he recognizes that it happened according to the hand of the Lord his God upon him. He recognized it to be God's grace. He was the kind of a man that saw the Lord in everything. Um, You know how sometimes you can talk with some people and uh, you could talk with them for two months straight and um, they'll never talk about the Lord. They they don't see the Lord in anything. And, uh, And then you talk with other people and it's the Lord this and the Lord that and the Lord did this and the Lord spared me here and the Lord opened this up over here and that kind of deal. And that's the kind of person that Ezra is. He sees the Lord in everything. And, and one of the reasons that he sees the Lord so clearly surrounding the things of his life is that he was a man who, again, familiar with the Scriptures, aware of the Scriptures. And so he, he's seeing the world around him in the context of God and not seeing God in the context of the world around him because of that familiarity with the Word. And so refreshing. Those kind of men, those kind of women are refreshing to come into contact with. There are not enough of them. There's not enough Ezra's that way that really, truly see the Lord operating daily in, in the things of their lives. And, and he, he saw it that way. And what a blessed life that is to recognize you know, the Lord at work in all the different things of his life. Verse 7, Some of the children of Israel, the priests, the Levites, the singers, the gatekeepers, and the Nethanim, came up to Jerusalem in the seventh year of King Artaxerxes. So he not only knew the word, he was a leader. Men were willing to follow him. And one of the ways you can know if you're a leader in the body of Christ is to turn around and see if anyone's following. And uh, if there isn't, then there's a problem there probably. Uh, Some issue or maybe just not called the lead. And Ezra came to Jerusalem in the fifth month which was in the seventh year of the king. And on the first day of the first month, he began his journey from Babylon. And on the first day of the fifth month, he came to Jerusalem according to the good hand of his God upon him. And he got to Jerusalem and he knew how he got to Jerusalem. It was through his skill and his cunning and all of the good planning and all of that. No, that's, a, that's, an, that's an okay life, but that's not the superior life. It was because the Lord was at work in his life. And again, the way he phrases it is the recognition of the grace of God. It wasn't just God working. It was God working, and he worked because he is gracious, and not because Ezra felt that he deserved it. And so they made this journey, and it took, uh, just as with Zerubbabel, over a thousand miles across the desert, and took four months for them to make the journey. And so uh, there's that characteristic of of self-sacrifice in his life. Um, how many of us would travel four months, a thousand miles over a desert to teach a Bible study? That's what he's doing. His heart's filled with the Word of God. He's eager to you know, train God's people in His Word. And so whatever that takes, whatever that means for God's will to be accomplished, then I'm going to do it. And that's the kind of heart that he had and and the love that he had for the Word of God, and and willingness to put his comfort aside in in order to do that. And so it tells us in verse 10 that Ezra had prepared his heart to seek the law of the Lord and to do it 
and to teach statutes and ordinances in Israel. That was his desire. That was his goal. That's what he lived for, was to teach the Word of God among God's people. Now, it's fascinating. You see a progression here, and that is that his heart, he had prepared his heart to seek the law of the Lord. In other words, he wanted to have a complete knowledge of the Word. And, and that's important as it relates to teaching. And so you see, for those of you who have the gift of teaching, you know, in the fellowship, is that necessity to seek the law of the Lord. When I see someone who says, boy, you know, I really want to teach God's Word and I want to start a home Bible study over here or I want to, you know, start a church someday or this kind of thing. And the, one of the first things I look for is a supernatural hunger for the Word of God. And when that isn't there... I don't know about that. Because there needs to be a great hunger for the Word of God. Uh, A hunger for the Word that's greater than the million and one things that can distract you from it. One of the great Bible teachers today, if I was to name his name, all of you would know it. (laughs) You hate that when people say stuff like that. You all know it. But anyway, one of the reasons somebody asked him, you know, as it related to his teaching and related to the depth of his teaching, they said, what do you attribute that to? And he said, and, and, and he said it so spiritually and so deep, he said, he said uh, the, the reason that my life might be different from some other lives is for one reason alone, and that is I keep my seat in my chair at my study longer than other people. And, and there's, there's just a lot of truth to that. And there's a hunger for the Word in in that kind of life. Many of you have a supernatural hunger for the Word of God. And so when I see that, I just I begin to look to see what kind of a teaching gift can can be in a person's life that way. But there has to be not only the seeking the law of the Lord, but there has to be that doing of it. Nobody is going to last as a teacher of the Word if they're not doing it. That you know that hypocrisy gets spotted pretty quickly. And so that seeking of the word, of the law of the Lord, doing it, and then the teaching of it. And I like this, that Ezra had prepared his heart to do these things. In other words, he wasn't just a man who had these things in his head as, as a servant of the Lord. These things gripped his heart. And, and in that culture, in that day when they spoke of the heart, when we talk about the heart, you know, we talk about the emotions. You know, you think that people would have enough of silly love songs. But I look around me and I see it isn't so. You know, so I mean, we talk about the heart. We talk about silly love songs and these kinds of things. You know, I mean, quoting a famous philosopher of our day. And <laughs> and so the mind, we you know, we view it as just this emotional thing. But in their day, that heart represented the bowels. It represented the deepest part. And so these truths, they didn't just have his mind. They had the deepest part of his life. They controlled the deepest part of his life. And so that's one of the reasons we're going to see the kind of thing that come out of his life is because he had that attitude toward the Word of God. He actually viewed it as the Word of God. You know, we talk about the Word of God, the Word of God, the Word of God. You just stop and think about that phrase for a moment. And any person that takes it seriously, you, you, can, you see what it would translate into as it relates to an attitude towards the Word and the place that the Word of God uh, ought to have in our lives and did have in Ezra's life and does have in so many of our lives too. Now, this is a copy of the letter, verse 11, that King Artaxerxes gave Ezra the priest, the scribe, expert in the words of the commandments of the Lord, and of his statutes to Israel. So the letter of Artaxerxes given to Ezra. Artaxerxes, king of kings, to Ezra the priest, you know, he's, you know, a little haughty, he'll find out he he isn't. Jesus is king of kings and lord of lords. But that was the title that he had. Artaxerxes, king of kings, to Ezra the priest, the scribe of the law of God of heaven. Perfect peace and so forth. I issue a decree that all those of the people of Israel and the priests and the Levites in my realm who volunteer to go up to Jerusalem may go with you. So King Artaxerxes opened it up, free freedom for the Jews to leave Babylon and return to Jerusalem. A second opportunity 
at returning to the land. And whereas you are being sent by the king of, and his seven counselors to inquire concerning Judah and Jerusalem with regard to the law of your God which is in your hand, and whereas you are to carry the silver and gold which the king and his counselors have freely offered to the God of Israel whose dwelling is in Jerusalem. And whereas all the silver and gold that you may find in all the province of Babylon, along with the free will offering of the people and the priests, are to be freely offered for the house of their God in Jerusalem. And now, therefore, be careful to buy with this money bulls, rams, lambs, with their grain offerings and their drink offerings, and offer them on the altar of the house of your God in Jerusalem. Jerusalem, And whatever seems good to you and your brethren to do with the rest of the silver and gold, do according to the will of your God. And also the articles that are given to you for the service of the house of the Lord uh, of your God, deliver in full before the God of Jerusalem. And whatever um, more may be needed for the house of your God, which you may have uh, occasion to provide Pay for it from the king's treasury. And I, even I, Artaxerxes the king, do issue a decree to all the treasurers who are in the region beyond the river that whatever Ezra the priest, the scribe of the law of God of heaven, may require of you, let it be done diligently. So he gives Ezra the command to go forth with the wealth, go forth with what they've been blessed with, and establish what God had called the children of Israel to be in the land. And he calls now Ezra to establish a system of, of judgment and government based upon the law and also return the people to the study of God's law. And he said that in verse um, 22 that this was to be given to them what was necessary for the doing of this up to 100 talents of silver, 100 cores of wheat, 100 baths of wine, 100 baths of oil and salt without prescribed limit. And so the king gives Ezra an expense account of about $100,000 a year to do what he needs to do there. And whatever is commanded by the God of heaven, verse 23, let it diligently be done for the house of the God of heaven. For why should there be wrath against the realm of the king and his sons? And so that was the reason for his decree. There was a fear and an awe for the Lord and he wanted to be on the good side of God's people. And also we inform you that it shall not be lawful to impose tax, tribute, or custom on any of the priests, Levites, singers, gatekeepers, Nephinim, or servants of this house of God. And you, Ezra, according to your God-given wisdom, set magistrates and judges who may judge all the people who are in the region beyond the river, all such as know the laws of your God, and teach them who do not know them. So set up this system of law based upon the law of Moses and then teach those that don't know about this law. And whoever will not observe the law of your God and the law of the king, let judgment be executed speedily on him, whether it be death or banishment or confiscation of goods or imprisonment. And then Ezra praises the Lord for this letter that he received. And he said, Blessed Be the Lord God of our fathers, who has put such a thing in this, the king's heart, to beautify the house of the Lord which is in Jerusalem. So again, he sees the Lord in it. He sees the Lord at at work in this decree. Again, because of the place of the word in his life. And has extended mercy to me before the king and his counselors and before all of the king's mighty princes. And so I was encouraged as the hand of the Lord my God was upon me. We see that again. And I gathered chief men of Israel to go up with me. And so he recognizes God's hand, his grace again, in all of these things. Chapter 8. These are the heads of their father's houses, and this is the genealogy of those who went up with me from Babylon in the reign of King Artaxerxes. And uh, so now he lists all of these names and the number of the men that followed him now volunteered to uh, be a part of that second return from the captivity 
and the listing of the men goes through verse 14, and all of those numbers totaled up, totals up to 1,514 men. And so the, uh, Ezra gathers the men together, and they gather by the river that flows to uh, Ava, and he camped there. they camped there three days. Now, this location was probably about eight days, eight day journey out of Babylon. It was just a place where Ezra could say, okay, whoever's following me, whoever's going to go with me now to Jerusalem, let's meet over here. So he could get out of the big city. The people could come together. Then he could see, you know, the hearts, the, the people whose hearts the Lord had touched and, and figure out what he had kind of to work with. And so they camped there uh, for three days uh, by this river, and this river was one of the tributaries to the Euphrates River. And so they camped there three days, and I looked among the people and the priests, and I found none of the sons of Levi's, uh, the sons of Levi there. And so they're separated away from Babylon. He looks at, you know, the people that have volunteered, and there's not a single person of the tribe of Levi that volunteered to go. <laughs> Crazy. There are only 74 that went with Zerubbabel on the first return from the captivity. And there were 50,000 men who went with him on that. 50,000 people returned with him on that particular return. Nobody really knows why none of the Levites were too hip to returning. But there is a little bit of speculation as it relates to that. And that was the Levites, in whatever place they were in, their support was dependent upon the giving of the people. And so they probably had entered into the workforce there in Babylon, had put their you know, Levitical kind of calling aside and become very, very prosperous in Babylon. That's why so few people left Babylon. The Jews became very prosperous there in Babylon. And so now the call goes out and, and uh, hey, we're returning now to Jerusalem how many of you want to go? And all Levites said, I didn't hear anything. Did you hear anything? I didn't hear anything about returning there or anything like that. Because, because the people that were going to go, they didn't know what they were going to be running into and didn't know whether the people were even going to you know, be well supported, let alone have anything left over, let alone be willing to obey the Lord in giving so that the Levites could be supported. So there were no... You know, there were no not much great faith among the sons of Levi here in this place. But uh, Ezra, he's not going to stand for that. So he sent for Eliezer in verse 16, Ariel, uh, Shimeiah, Elnathan, uh, Jerob, Elnathan again, Nathan, Zechariah, and uh, Meshulam, leaders also for uh, Joyarib and Elnathan, men of understanding. So he calls for these men who were leaders. He calls for these men of understanding uh, basically to go find some Levites. And uh, he's a wise man. He looks, for, uh, he looks for good people to carry his message. And he, I gave them a command, verse 17, I gave them a command for Edo, the chief man at this place, and I told them what they should say to Edo and his brethren, the Nephinim, at that place, that they should bring us servants for the house of our God. And so Edo is apparently over the um, Levites and over the Nephinim, which were a part of the Levites that were involved in the physical taking care of, of the things concerning the temple. And so they said, you know, they sent the message basically and said, you know, we put a call out and none of the Levites showed up. Uh, what can you do about this? And then Ezra again in verse 18, I'm going to point it up every time we hit it going through because... Um, because I'm going to. And he says right there, Then by the good hand of our God upon us, he recognizes the Lord in it again, they brought us a man of understanding of the sons of uh, Mali, the son of Levi, the son of Israel, named uh, Sherebiah, with his sons and brothers, 18 men. So these were men of the Levites, and uh, Hashabiah, and with him uh, Jeshiah, and the sons of the sons of Merai, his brothers and their sons, 20 men, also of the Nephinim, whom David and the leaders had appointed for the service of the Levites, 220 Nephinim, all of them were designated by men. So in, 
a total of 258 um, uh, Levites uh, added to the you know 1,514 men that came out of all of the other tribes, and we have a, a little over a little less than 1,800 men who volunteered for this return to Jerusalem, not counting the women and, and the children. Again, compared to the 50,000 that went with Zerubbabel earlier. Verse 21, And then I proclaimed, Ezra said, a fast there at the river of Ahava, and that we might humble ourselves before our God uh, to seek from Him the right way for us and our little ones and all of our possessions. And so he calls a fast before they begin the journey. And, and the fasting in all prayer is an expression of humility. It's an expression of dependence. And, and so it was just a time to say, Lord, you know, here we are. We're ready to go. And we need you to show yourself strong on our behalf. And, and, um, and, and we need you to give us the kind of wisdom that we need and the kind of protection that we're going to be needing, not just for us, but for our little ones and for all of our possessions. And one of the reasons for the, the fasting and the seeking of the Lord in humility is revealed in verse 22. And he said, For I was ashamed to request of the king an escort of, of soldiers and horsemen to help us against the enemy on the road, because we had spoken to the king, saying, The hand of our God is upon all those for good who seek Him, but His power and His wrath are against all those who forsake Him. And so um, Ezra's been bragging on the Lord, uh, you know, to his boss. And then his boss says, all right, go ahead and head on out and do what you want. I give you all these things to go ahead and do it. And, and he's been talking about how God's able to keep his people and protect his people and provide for his people. And so he thought if I go back to the king and, and ask him to provide a guard for us, it's going to misrepresent my Lord. It's going to misrepresent what I've been saying about the Lord. And so it looks like he was tempted to do so. But he couldn't do it because of kind of his bragging that he had been doing concerning the Lord. Have you ever kind of, you know, bragged on the Lord a little bit and then uh, found yourself in a situation where then you had to believe it? That's kind of where he's at. It's kind of where he's at. My God is so big, so strong, and so mighty, there's nothing my God cannot do. You know, we teach the kids to sing that song, and our little ones, well, they're not little anymore, but when they were little and they do it, and, and so, in our own ways, we declare these things. And then the Lord sometimes can say, great, hey, I like that. Let me just check and see if you believe that, just for a moment, if I can. But here with Ezra, he understood that he was representing the Lord and he was going to be careful with what he said because he didn't want to misrepresent the Lord. And so they're heading across a thousand mile journey, bandits everywhere, thieves everywhere, roaming bands of uh, marauders everywhere. And so uh, now, you know, he's praying for God's safety. And so they had boasted in the Lord. The Lord, you know, made them stand on what they're boasting. And so in verse 23, And so we fasted and treated our God for this, and He answered our prayer. And so, again, faith left unashamed uh, in the life of Ezra. Always left unashamed in our life, too. As I tell you, I've never been ashamed of any standing in faith in the Lord and in His promises. Look scary at times. At times it looked like I was going to be ashamed. didn't look like it was going to come through. I mean, the Lord sometimes takes it right up to the edge and then over the edge, and He redefines the edge. I mean, and your whole world is spinning. You know, I, right now it's, it's a point in a sermon. It's a lesson on a page. But when we're in the middle of it, it's rough. It's rough. But when enough time goes by and we're able to look back, there's always that acknowledgement. Oh, Lord, boy, I'm not ashamed of what you did at all. It was completely different from what I was telling you to do. 
<laughs> I suppose you don't tell God what to do once in a while. <laughs> or I was suggesting so strongly that you might do. And, and yet, never, ever left ashamed. And they weren't left ashamed either. And then I separated twelve of the leaders of the priests, uh, Sherebiah and uh, Hashabiah, and the ten of their brethren with them. And I counted out to them the silver, the gold, and the articles, the offering for the house of our God, which the king and his counselors and his prince, princes and all Israel who were present had offered. And so they've got this certain amount of wealth that's been entrusted into their hands to take to Jerusalem to deliver for the work of the temple. And so Ezra is a smart man. He's a smart leader. He recognizes that money for a leader is something to be careful of. Billy Graham made it famous. Uh, God made it famous first when he talked about the kings of Israel. They were not to multiply horses to themselves. Careful of pride. Not to multiply wives to themselves. Careful of the opposite sex. Not to multiply gold to themselves. Careful with money. So he's a wise man. He's being careful with money. He doesn't want to carry all this money himself. He wants some accountability related to it. And so he's going to spread it out among these 12 men. And the neat thing about it is he's not only wanting to be careful as it relates to his own accountability, but he wants to be careful not to tempt any of the men that he entrusts the riches to to stumble or, you know, to mishandle the money. You know, some people, 20 bucks, they're going to mess it up. And, and so he wants to be careful about who he gives it to. So he devises a system where if, as maybe he, you know, Heshabiah is there and he's given two golden you know, candlesticks to deliver to Jerusalem. So what do they do? He brings them forth and he had, had the, the priests weigh them. So he wouldn't carve away at it, maybe. You know, grind a little gold off or something. Had a weighed inventory. And then that inventory would be taken in Jerusalem so that nobody would even think twice about messing with what was the Lord's. There's tremendous wisdom here and practical wisdom in the handling of the Lord's wealth. And so I weighed into their hands, he says, 650 talents of silver, silver articles weighing 100 talents, 100 talents of gold, 20 uh, gold basins worth a thousand drachmas, and two vessels of fine polished bronze, precious as gold. And I said to them, you are holy, speaking to the priests and the Levites who were going to carry this stuff, and the articles are holy too, because everyone belonged to the Lord. And the silver and the gold are a free will offering to the Lord God of your fathers. Watch and keep them. Again, that accountability. Watch them, keep them, until you weigh them out before the leaders of the priests and the Levites and the heads of the fathers' houses of Israel in Jerusalem. In other words, nothing better be missing in the chambers of the house of the Lord. And so the priests and the Levites received the silver and the gold and the articles by weight to bring them to Jerusalem, to the house of our God. And then we departed from that river on the twelfth day of the first month to go to Jerusalem. And the hand of our God was upon us. And he delivered us from the hand of the enemy and from ambush along the road. And so we came to Jerusalem. We stayed there three days then on the fourth day, the silver and the gold and the articles were weighed in the house of our God by the hand of Merimoth, the son of Uriah the priest. And with him was Eleazar, the son of Phinehas. And with them were the Levites, Jozebad, the son of uh, Jesh, uh, Jeshua, and this guy, the son of that, <laughs> that one. That's a funny name. I'm going to try that. With the number and the weight of everything, all the weight, was written down at that time, and the children of those who had been carried away from captive, who had come from the captivity, offered burnout offerings to the God of Israel, twelve bulls for all Israel, uh, one for each tribe, ninety-six rams, seventy-seven lambs, twelve male goats as a sin offering, again one each for the tri each of the tribes. All this was a burnt offering to the Lord, and they delivered the king's orders to the king's uh, satraps and the governors in the region beyond the river 
And so they gave support to the people and the house of God. And so the regional governors, they supported them to the tune that had been spoken by Artaxerxes to do so. Chapter 9. And when these things were done, the leaders came to me. I mean, he's, he's hardly gotten there. The leaders came to him saying, The people of Israel and the priests and the Levites have not separated themselves from the peoples of the lands with respect to the abominations of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Perizzites, the Jebusites, the Ammonites, the Moabites, the Egyptians, and the Amorites. For they have taken some of their daughters as wives for themselves and their sons uh, so that the holy seed is intermingled with the peoples of those lands. Indeed, the hand of the leaders and rulers has been foremost in this trespass. Now, it's been... Uh, the, there's a gap between chapter 6 and chapter 7 of the book of Ezra, and the gap is about 58 years. And, and you might just make a note between those chapters that the book of Esther, the, uh, the uh, account of the book of Esther occurs between those two chapters during those 58 years. But Zerubbabel had come in that first return from the captivity so many years earlier. And he is no doubt long ago dead. And the people now have ceased now to follow the Lord. The men and the women that came back from the captivity, from Babylon, um, now, as they've returned to Jerusalem, they've begun to engage themselves in the sins of the people that were around them and sin that was forbidden by God. God had commanded them that they were not to intermarry among the nations of the people that were in that area of the world that God had displaced them out of. They were to only marry uh, among themselves, among Hebrews, among the people of God. And so they come in, and, and here Ezra comes, and immediately he's confronted with willful disobedience. This isn't something like, oh man, we didn't know. Oh, I'm so glad you told me. I'm so, somebody, I'm so glad somebody told me. I'm so messed up. I didn't even realize. It wasn't one of those situations. They knew what the Word said, and they said, I don't care what His Word says. I want to marry that person. And so this widespread willful disobedience, transgression against the Word of God among God's people had occurred. And it had happened foremost among the leaders. And then the people had no doubt followed them in that. And so we see the leaders mentioned, the priests and the Levites, foremost in this particular transgression against the Word of God. Fascinating thing is that when someone comes and reports this to Ezra, you notice that they talk about the fact that God's people were now intermingling the holy seed with the people that were around them. What does that mean? They understood this. God had promised that Messiah would come through those people. That He would come through the Jews. And so, in His promise to do that, they were, they were holy. Their seed was holy. And so, they didn't know through which person. I mean, they knew which tribe. They knew these things through the lineage of David. But they didn't know which within that that God was going to use then to bring His seed, to bring His Son into the world. And then to casually take that call of God upon their life and throw it away to intermingle it with everyone else. God said, I mean, it was a serious, serious thing. They were losing their distinction among the people. They were being absorbed by the people. And the problem with it was this. In their eyes, they just looked at it and said, all right, we're getting absorbed by the people. And so it's just my life. I've chosen this way. I'm being absorbed by the world that's around me. God looks at it, Ezra looks at it and says, the stakes are far higher than your life. The willful disobedience of God's people don't just put my life in jeopardy, it puts His plan in jeopardy. 
His eternal desires in jeopardy. The stakes are so high. The stakes are so high. And they have lost sight of it. Lost sight of it. The importance of obedience to every command of God, however small or large or small a person may view them to be, it's all important or God wouldn't have said anything about it. And so the willful disobedience. And notice what Ezra does here when he hears about uh, this thing, this willful disobedience. Verse 3, he said, So when I heard this thing, I tore my garment, I tore my clothes and my robe. That was an outward sign of mourning. And then he says, I plucked out some of the hair of my head and beard, and I sat down astonished. All signs of mourning. It was very common for them to tear their clothes in in mourning and then throw ashes or dirt on them. And then it was a little less common, but fairly common in a time of mourning for a man to take and shave his head or to shave his beard off. It was a sign of mourning. Ezra, when he hits the willful disobedience among God's people, he doesn't even wait to shave his head or to shave his beard. He begins to pluck it out of his very face and and off of his head. He is stunned at, at this willful disobedience among God's people. And it says that he sat down astonished there at the end of verse 3. And that whole word there in the original language for astonished, it carries with it the idea of silence. Tore his robe and he tore his garments and he plucked out his hair and he plucked out his beard and he just plopped down absolutely astonished. Too astonished to say anything. And I, I love his response. The power of his response. It, it, it smites my heart. It really does. It instructs me. Because it challenges me. And it asks me, is that the way that I respond to willful disobedience in my life? Is that the way that I respond to willful disobedience among God's people? I'll tell you, what if that was the response of God's people in the face of hearing transgression among God's people? I think the attitude towards willful disobedience would change entirely. There's such a casualness as it relates to sin, isn't there? We really have to fight it. Again, I'm sure it's that way all over the world, but we really have to fight a casualness related to that. And, and you know, well, you know, this person's doing this, and this person's doing this in their business, they're doing this privately, they're doing this willful disobedience, and you, you just hear so much about it, you just, you cease to be shocked, you cease to grieve over it, cease to be, you know, astonished as it relates to that. And, and I want to be an Ezra, I want to be astonished at these things, and in my life or, or when I hear them and, and turn to the Lord. And so, beautiful, beautiful example in his life. Why did he have that response? Place of the Word in his life. Place of the Word in his life. The Bible says in the book of James that the Word is a mirror. It's a mirror. It really is. The Word is constantly revealing to us what the righteous standard is. You know, you live um, a week away from the Bible and, and reading the Bible. And I forget what the statistics are. It's like 70% of professing Christianity in the United States of America um, does not read the Bible beyond what they read in a particular church uh, on, a, on given Sundays. So it's a large group. And, and with all of the input of the world... And, and the relativism of the world. Pretty soon I find my standard so far down, nothing shocks me anymore. There's a real danger for us. And it's, I just, I, you know, we just need to be Ezra's in this. It should stun us. And then in verse 4, then everyone who trembled, and I, you know, the strength of that word, tremble to be terrified, is what it literally means. Everyone who was terrified or trembled at the words of the God of Israel assembled to Ezra because of the transgression of those who had uh, had been carried away captive. And he said, I sat astonished 
until the evening sacrifice. Couldn't say anything. The people that were terrified as it relates to the Word, they knew what the Word said. They had a, a real soberness related to it. They joined themselves to Ezra. But Ezra was a lightning rod. He, he modeled something. He modeled something that was right among God's people. And, and he was willing to lead in, in that morning. And then out of the woodwork came others that were less courageous than him. But they said, we feel the same way. And they, and they came around and they began to sit with him. Isn't it funny how oftentimes in a work situation or a school situation or something where um, a person will make a stand for the Lord in, in a setting and you make it alone. And, and, uh, and, and everyone, you know, thinks you a fool for, for doing it or whatever, risking what you've risked to do it. And then isn't it interesting over the next day or so, how many, you know, Christians that were around the scene, they watched it and then they're emboldened by it and, and come in and begin to speak about the same things. It's contagious. You know, fear is contagious, but faith is com- contagious too. And so he sat down until the time of the evening sacrifice. And at the evening sacrifice, he arose from his fasting and uh, having torn my garment. And uh, I fell, he said, on my knees and I spread out my hands to the Lord my God. And so now his prayer to the Lord at the time of the evening sacrifice. And he and you know as he falls down. You know, before the Lord ha- spreading out His hands, just surrendering everything to the Lord. It's a, it's a nice place to be, you know, when you hit those kind of places and, and you know, the hands go up and a, and a universal, you know, symbol of surrender. They just go, Lord, nothing to hide, nothing to hide, nothing to hide in this situation. Lord, what are we going to do here? What do you want to do here? And, and so he falls down and he says, Oh my God, I'm too ashamed and humiliated to lift my face to You, my God. For our iniquities have risen higher than our heads and our guilt has grown up to the heavens. And so that's how big he saw the sin. I mean, we're drowning in the sin, Lord. It's risen above our heads. It's grown up to the heavens. Plural pronouns that he uses there in verse 6. Our, our, our. Fascinating thing is that he hadn't married a a woman from uh, one of those countries, and yet he identifies himself with the people that have sinned. Here's real maturity, isn't it? He's stunned at the sin. He's shocked at the sin. He's going to make a very strong and righteous stand against the sin. But there is that recognition within his own heart that it's something that he was capable of doing too. And that here he is among the people. Didn't do it. But, you know, Lord, you know, this is your body. This is your people. This is your people that you're committed to. And so he identifies himself uh, with, with these. He doesn't say, you know, hear these people now, just wipe them out. You know, he, uh, he wants there to be restoration. He identifies himself with God's people. And since the days of our fathers to this day, we've been very guilty. And for our iniquities, we, our kings and our priests, have been delivered into the hand of the kings of the lands to the sword, to captivity, to plunder, and to humiliation as it is this day. And so he talks about the fact that the reason their captivity was their own sin. And he says in verses 8 and 9, speaking about God's grace, and he said, and now, that's what once happened, but now for a little while, while grace has been shown from the Lord our God to leave us a remnant to escape and to give us a peg in His holy place that our God might enlighten our eyes and give us a measure of revival in our bondage. And so he says, God, you gave us grace to return from the consequences of our willful disobedience to you. And, and you know, you gave us a peg and, and that, that recognition that, uh, you know, their lives represented a small number of people in the land. But it represented something that something great was hanging on. And, and God's plan was hanging on them and their faithfulness to His Word. And He said, For we were slaves, yet our God did not forsake us in our bondage, but He extended mercy to us in the sight of the kings of Persia to revive us, to repair the house of our God, to rebuild its ruins, and to give us a wall in Judah 
in Jerusalem. And now, O oh, our God, what shall we say after this, after all this grace that you've shown us? For we have forsaken your commandments, which you have commanded by your servants, the prophets, saying, the land which you are entering to possess is an unclean land with the uncleanness of the peoples of the land with their abominations which have filled it from one end to another with their impurity. And so he's saying, God, you were gracious to us, and then here's how we repaid you. First chance we got, we all you know, returned back to disobeying you, an unworthy response to God's grace. And he said, now therefore do not give your daughters as wives for their sons, nor take their daughters to your sons, and never seek their peace or prosperity, that you may be strong and eat the good of the land, and leave it as an inheritance to your children forever. And after all that has come upon us for our evil deeds and for our great guilt, since you, our God, have punished us less than our iniquities deserve and have given us such deliverance as this. Lord, again, you've been so gracious to us. Should we again you know, break your commandments and join in marriage with the people of those abominations? Would you not be angry with us until you had consumed us so that there would be no remnant or survivor? And so if disobeying him in this way led to bondage you know, before in their history, how could it but lead to bondage again in, in their life. And, and so it's the same you know, characteristic so often with an individual life, that grace of God pulling us out of the miry clay, grace poured out on our lives, and then the repaying of that grace with returning back to the sin. It's, it's just an illogical response to God's grace. And so he said, O oh Lord God of Israel, you are righteous, for we are left as a remnant as it is this day, here we are before you in our guilt, though no one can stand before you because of this. And so no excuses, no anything. God, this is what we're dealing with. This is where we're at. And, and I confess it. Chapter 10. Now while Ezra was praying and while he was confessing, weeping, bowing down before the house of God, a very large congregation of men, women, and children assembled with him from Israel, for the people wept very bitterly. You see what he set off? Just one man uh, with the heart of God. Just one man with, with a, a, a desire to please God and be righteous in the sight of the Lord. And then uh, Sekaniah, the son of Jael, one of the sons of Elam, spoke up and said to Ezra, and he's speaking now for himself and others that have married these wives that were forbidden, he said, we have trespassed, and that word trespass is a, is a deliberate disobedience. We've trespassed against our God and have taken pagan wives from among, from the peoples of the land, yet now there is hope in Israel in spite of this. And so, what is the hope? It gets to the hope in verse 3. The hope is, now therefore let us make a covenant with our God to put away all of these wives and those who have been born to them according to the counsel of my Master and of those who tremble at the commandment of our God and let it be done according to the law. And so what was the only hope for that situation, for willful disobedience? Repentance. Confessing of my sin, repenting of my sin, and then doing what God has called me to do. First John 1 John 1.9, called the you know, bar of soap, Christian bar of soap in the Bible. If we confess our sin, God is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. The interesting thing is the word confess there in 1 John 1, 9 isn't just, you know, verbalizing it. It means to see the sin the way he sees it. And so there's that confession. And when I see it the way he sees it, there's going to be a turning from that sin and then the Lord is able to restore. And so there, there is hope, but the only hope for willful disobedience is a confession of sin, repentance, doing what God's Word has said. But there is that privilege of repentance. That's the breakthrough, and that's what they're going to do, and uh, God is going to uh, honor uh, their repentance. And then he says, Arise. He says this to Ezra. 
Arise, for this matter is your responsibility, and we'll be with you. Be of good courage and do it. And so, here's the sinner saying to the leader, All right, that's what you got sent for from Artaxerxes. Now do what you're supposed to do. We haven't done what we were supposed to do, but you lead. And don't be afraid to lead. You be courageous in it and do what's right. And that's a, you know, that's a great encouragement to a guy in, in Ezra's, uh, you know, position there. And, and, uh, just a nice, a nice thing to have said. It probably meant a lot to him. And then Ezra arose and he made the leaders of the priests, the Levites, and all Israel swear an oath that they would do according to this word. So they swore an oath. And uh, you'll notice that Ezra doesn't get too excited when even God's people swear an oath. He rose up uh, from before the house of God. He went into the chamber of uh, Jehoan and the son of Eliashib. And then, and when he came there, he ate no bread, drank no water. He continued his fast, for he mourned because of the guilt of those of the captivity. So he doesn't say, all right, God's people have confessed their sin and they, they say they're going to repent. They're going to do what's right. I'm going to break my fast. <laughs> you know, he says, I'm going to well, believe it when I see it. So he, he continues his fast. I mean, it sounds like he's been around a while. And so then they issued a proclamation throughout Judah and Jerusalem to all of the descendants of the captivity that they must gather in Jerusalem. And so he issues this proclamation to come and that whoever would not come within three days... According to the counsel of the elders, of the leaders and elders, all of his property would be confiscated and he himself would be separated from the congregation of those from the captivity. So he uses some pretty you know, hard things to motivate him, but he knows what he's dealing with. He knows he's dealing with some people. He's still going to get resistance from them as it relates to repenting. And so he uses the only kind of motivation that he knew they would understand. And so a bit of a threat. And so all of the men of Judah and Benjamin gathered at Jerusalem within three days. It was the ninth month on the twentieth day of the month. And all the people sat in the open square of the house of God, trembling because of this matter and because of the heavy rain. And so that time of the year, it was December. It's a rainy season over there in Israel, just like it is here. And then Esther, the priest, stood up and he said to them, You've transgressed and have taken pagan wives, adding to the guilt of Israel. That's a very direct dealing with sin. He doesn't bring up anyone's mother or anything like that. He just, you, this is what you've done here now. Let's take responsibility for it. And he says, now therefore, make confession to the Lord God of your fathers and do. I want you, to, you need to confess, but now you need to do His will. Separate yourselves from the peoples of the land and from the pagan wives. So what's needed is repentance and not any excuses. And then all the congregation answered. They said with a loud voice, Yes, as you have said, so we must do. And so they agreed to do it. But they said, There are many people. It's the season for heavy rain. And we're not able to stand outside. Nor is this the work of one or two days. For there are many of us who have transgressed in this matter. So... He said, this is going to be a a bit of a longer process than a couple of days, Ezra, and so can we go about this in an orderly fashion. Please let the leaders of our entire congregation stand and let all those in our cities who have taken pagan wives come at appointed times, gather with the elders and judges of the cities until the fierce wrath of our God is turned away from us in this matter. And only Jonathan, the son of uh, Ashiel, and uh, Jehaziah, uh, or whatever, the son of uh, Tikva, opposed this, and um, uh, Meshulam and uh, Sabbathai, the Levite, gave them support. So it's interesting, verse 15, these four guys, they didn't like the plan. So they opposed the plan. And uh, God wrote their name down in the Bible. And there it is for eternity. They didn't like the plan. Now the interesting thing is, is you look at uh, Meshulam there. He he doesn't like this. He opposes it. But then you go over into verse 29, and ooh, there's a Meshulam there. Uh, so maybe he, you know, he didn't like what was coming down, and, and because he was guilty in the whole thing. And then the descendants of the captivity, they did so. And Ezra the priest, with certain heads 
of the father's households were set apart by the father's households, each of them by name. And they sat down on the first day of the tenth month to examine the matter. And by the first day of the first month, uh, they finished questioning all the men who had taken pagan wives. So it took about three months to process uh, the matter and establish how far-reaching the sin was and to correct it. And among the sons of the priests who had taken pagan wives, the following were found of the sons of Jeshua, uh, the son of Josedak and his brothers. And then it begins, it lists their name. And, and notice he lists the priests before he lists you know, the, the common people. And so here are the priests' name listed because, um, you know, greater judgment. Be not many masters, you're going to face the harsher judgment. And so they're listed. And notice in verse 19, they gave their promise that they would put away their wives. And being guilty, they presented a ram of the flock as their trespass offering. And so then they list all of these other names uh, through the chapter. And we're told in verse 44, all of these had taken pagan wives, and some of them had wives by whom they had children. Now, there is no doubt that these men remained responsible for the support of these wives and the support of the children out of these marriages. And so they had to deal with the consequences of their sin, and uh, no doubt they had taken care of it. So... God takes and, and he uh, gives a record of, of the men who had involved themselves in this. Uh, the guilty were listed. And uh, this was a list here at the end of chapter 10 that you wouldn't want to find yourself on. And uh, one of the great things about being in Christ Jesus is he's taken us off of all of these other lists that our names used to be on. And so uh, the grace of the Lord but the importance of obedience to His Word and being a faithful witness by the power of the Holy Spirit, uh, uh, you know, in as they hadn't done, uh, because so much was at stake as it relates to their lives. They were a holy seed. And uh, we are likewise, the Lord is desiring to continually birth great things by His Holy Spirit through our lives. And so... Seventeen priests were involved in this. Ten Levites were involved in this. Eighty-seven other men were involved in this. Especially tragic that the leaders were. And so we finish the book of Ezra. Ezra, a study in the kind of life that comes out of that proper place of the Word of God in a life. Beautiful, beautiful lesson.